Ah, don't you love Thanksgiving? Such a festive season to spend time with the family and enjoy a nice juicy turkey. But maybe you're not a turkey person. That's okay, there's plenty of alternatives from chicken, duck, or your stepmother. My god, what do we have here? Addison Ray and Lewis lit in a horror slasher? Oh yes, the movie everyone needs but not the one we deserve. In this video, I'll be going through the events that unfold in Thanksgiving. The goal is to identify the mistakes made by our high IQ characters and how to overcome them in order to stay alive and beat the John Carver killer. Before I start, we just hit 200 subscribers and I want to say thank you. It means so much to me and I love all 200 of you. Back to the video. Thomas is the owner of the Superstore Right Mart and it just so happens to be Black Friday today. To celebrate the big opening, he hosts a Thanksgiving dinner and we are joined by some friends and family. We have his daughter Jessica, her boyfriend Bobby and her stepmom slash Thomas's new girlfriend Kathleen. We are also joined by the store manager Mitch with his wife Amanda and lastly the town sheriff Newland. But before he can even take a seat, he's called for backup at the superstore. With the store approaching its grand opening, the crowd outside begin to get more and more impatient. As this is going on, Jessica and Bobby exercise their privilege and enter the store early through the back to avoid the masses. They're joined by their jock friends Evan and Scuba and their girlfriends Gabby and Yulia. These are the heroes we'll be following throughout the movie and I won't go too much into detail about their personalities. Why you might ask? Well, you might end up rooting against them. But to summarise, Evan and Scuba are your typical American jock bullies and Gabby and Yulia are your typical Gen Z trying to get famous off TikTok girls. Anyway, their antics don't sit too well with the crowd outside who see them through the windows and they begin pushing forward more aggressively. My dearest American viewers, could you please confirm in the comment section if this is how Black Friday usually goes? Letting the group in early is a bigger blunder than it seems at first. Humans are driven by psychology and FOMO is already through the roof, so imagine seeing some teens gloating as they're holding up the latest iPhone. If you want your daughter and her band of Ivy League friends to get early access, at least be discreet about it. As for the crowd outside, Jesus, where do I even begin? To ensure crowd safety, especially on an event such as Black Friday, maintaining the flow of movement is the number one priority. Take the Hillsborough disaster as an extreme case in point for the detrimental consequences of crowd surging catastrophes. To prevent a similar situation from happening, we should implement a queuing system that lets X amount of shoppers in at a time. Barricades should be set up in a way that isn't directly in front of the store and should be formed with adequate numbers of breaks and turns in regular intervals to reduce the risk of customers pushing from the rear and possibly crushing others. What we definitely shouldn't rely on are two security guards and a waist-high barricade parallel to the entrance to control these ravenous shoppers. There needs to be at least a dozen more guards spaced out evenly and all trained and prepared prior to Black Friday. None of these procedures were implemented and it just about goes as you would expect. Okay, maybe it was worse than I expected. Shit, I completely forgot it was an Eli Roth movie. With that being said, this poor employee has found himself the victim of crowd crushing. Crowd density is considered dangerous when it exceeds 5 or more people per square meter. Your priority should be to stay on your feet, keep your arms from being pinned or stuck and conserve oxygen by grabbing your opposite forearm with your dominant hand to create a shield. To stay on your feet, you need to brace yourself in a boxing stance but if you can, move with the crowd rather than pushing against it. If you find yourself on the floor like this guy, try to get up as soon as possible but if you can't, go into a fetal position on your side and protect your head as you're most vulnerable on your back or stomach. Unfortunately, the employee gets viciously trampled. Despite being in a safe and spacious area, Bobby tries to play hero to save the employee which is commendable but at this point, he should be looking for exit opportunities as is every man for himself. His heroic act results in his arm being crushed which I can't exactly show you but if you're curious, boil some spaghetti and flap it about. That's pretty much what his arm looks like. As this is going on, Amanda finds herself in a similar situation after being knocked over on the floor. The only difference is that she's surrounded by plenty of space, has no injury and has at least 10 seconds of screen time to get up, but she decides to crawl around instead. I'll give her the benefit of the doubt though as she's probably juiced up with adrenaline and cortisol, thus needs a little bit of sense knocked into her. Speaking of knocking something into her, she gets knocked out unconscious by a shopping trolley but things are about to get a whole lot worse for her. Her hair gets caught between the wheels of the car and it slowly scalps her alive revealing the 5 brain cells she had that made her decide not to get up before. 
Unfortunately for Amanda, due to the chaos of everything, nobody notices her bleed out on the floor until it's too late. A year goes by after this tragedy and Evan has since gone viral after posting a video of the Thanksgiving massacre. It also happens to be approaching Thanksgiving again and the people of the town are protesting against Reitmark from holding another opening despite the numerous PR attempts from Thomas. We also find out that Bobby has left town and gone ghost mode following his arm injury which ended his college baseball career. With him out of the picture, Ryan, who for the past year has been simping over Jess, finally has his chance to slide in. As they're all sat at the diner, they each get a notification from an account named John Carver which tags them all in the picture of a dinner table. While not quite alarming yet, I'll definitely keep my eye out for anyone who might have a motive to play these little games with us. Later that night when the diner lady is closing up, she gets an unexpected visit. You see, she was one of the many inconsiderate people at the Right Mark Massacre and it seems someone is out for revenge. Listen lady, that mask was not there 5 seconds ago when you left the room and you know for a fact every customer and staff member has left. However, in her defence, she could not have anticipated being jumped from behind by our slasher who dons the pilgrim mask of John Carver. I'll keep it real, losing your vision greatly diminishes your chance of survival. She also gets submerged into water and then frostbitten against the freezer wall but she finds herself getting a lucky break. The carver walks away to grab an axe rather than finishing her off and this gives her enough time to escape into a nearby storage room rather than turning literally left and running outside to call for help. She doesn't even lock the room and her touchscreen doesn't work due to the blood on her hand so she better get sucking on those fingers. Her face ID also doesn't work either because she's, well, she's missing a chunk of her face. Most smartphones nowadays have an SOS system that can be easily accessed from the lock screen. My main concern however is that she hasn't locked a room and even if she does I don't doubt for one second that this is going to stop our carver from giving her the Jack Torrance treatment. This gives us no other choice but to arm ourselves with anything that can be used as a weapon and camp by the door. We can then bash his head in if he does decide to poke it through while we wait for the police. The advantage we're working with is his limited peripheral vision from the mask coupled with our intel of outside the room from the CCTV cameras behind her. The disadvantage we're dealing with is we don't know how well trained the carver is and also the lack of escape options. None of this matters though because she decides to make a run for it unarmed which goes very smoothly. Ah, like a deer caught in headlights. You know, after hours of pondering and gathering with the finest thinkers of our generation, we finally have the solution to this predicament. Do anything but try to outrun this car in a straight line. Literally anything. Like, run sideways. Guess what she does? Wow, that was a gut-wrenching death. I'll keep it real, running sideways to avoid being rammed only delays our death as we've lost our vision and the carver would easily just leave the car to hunt us on foot. Unless we happen to run into other people, this death is unbeatable. The next day, the citizens of the town wake up to find the lower half of the lady on top of the Right Mart logo. This image is then posted on the John Carver Instagram account and once again it tags all our protagonists. You would think the police would put these teens on 24 hours surveillance while they pile their resources into tracing the location of our killer, but they brush it off like it's nothing. After an unsuccessful attempt to convince the police of their imminent danger, the group run into McCarthy who is actually the most respectable character in this movie so far. While the town's dealing with a murder, he's capitalising on fear and anxiety to sell guns and alcohol. I gotta respect the hustle and ability to identify trends in the market and meet these demands. Anyway, outside the police station, Jessica runs into her ex Bobby who has now seemingly returned to the town. As this is going on, we find out on the news that the police have identified that the killer is targeting people present at the massacre and one of the security guards makes the smart decision to pack his stuff up and lay low. It also wouldn't be surprising if the police reported on the news about the killer's calling card being a well placed mask and to advise everyone to be aware of this. This may explain why he recognises the mask placed on the sofa and makes the smart decision to pick up the baseball bat. By this point, you know the drill. Grab a weapon, enter a room with one direct exit and barricade it with your bed, shelves and desk. Call the police and camp the door in case our killer decides to take the brute force approach. Our security guard's decision making skills take a nosedive when he taunts the killer which reveals his own location. He then proceeds to make the highest IQ play ever done in movie history. He asks the cat where the killer is. This results in our security guard being shanked from behind and then decapitated with a fibre wire garret in a very sophisticated and well trained fashion, something I highly doubt a teenager coming off a broken arm injury could pull off. 
The next day, the gang are once again tagged in a photo of the security guard's head, and the police finally decide it's time to track him down once and for all. They find out the killer isn't even using a VPN, he's literally driving to a location and hitting post and then driving away. My god, are there not street cameras? Check to see when he uploaded, then analyse vehicles within that location at that time and then cross-examine with vehicles from the location of the first victim. Back at school, the gang decide to meet up as they don't believe the police are doing enough to catch the killer. Makes sense, he's too nice. Okay, let's not be naive here, I mean- Oh shit, the High IQ Mensa Society have gathered to share intel on who they think the killer is and what their next plan of action should be. Let's take a peek and see what they come up with. The best defense is a good offense. Me and you, we go after them, fuck them up one by one. How about no? This is a trained methodical killer with a plan that seems like he's spent many months implementing. We're gonna have to come up with something a little more strategic. Before the gang get anywhere with their plan, the killer decides to bring the offense to them instead. In the gymnasium, Amy and Lonnie, who are prime shit stirrers during the Right Mark massacre, share little alone time in the dark, but before you know it, our killer sneaks up behind them. He makes Lonnie's head turn like an owl and Amy doesn't notice as she's too busy on the trampoline which lets our killer stab her from underneath Freddy Krueger style. Right, knowing that there's a reported killer about targeting people who are at the massacre means we should keep our wits about and certainly avoid the dark, isolated areas where no one can see or hear us scream. With that being said, these two definitely couldn't have avoided their fate as our killer was once again methodical in his approach and there was no way they could have been alerted of his presence. Following their deaths, the police arrive to the scene at the school and for some reason Evan and Gabby go for a walk down the very place where a murder has just taken place. There literally is no reason why they do this and the movie doesn't even try to explain why, they're just like, yeah, we're gonna walk this way. As expected, they both get jumped by the killer. Anyway, Jess goes to find Gabby and Evan and once again decides to walk down the very hallways where a murderer was at a mere 20 minutes ago and surprise surprise, John Carver's here XP farming these kids. Holy shit Jess, maybe run towards the police 20 feet away? You can see the goddamn sirens reflecting off the lockers. Ugh, doesn't matter. Let's see what genius hiding spot she's come up with. No way. Certainly not my first choice hiding spot, but I wouldn't be finding myself in this position to begin with. Anyway, she narrowly escapes the carver and manages to reach the police outside along with the rest of the group. Right, the killer attacking 20 feet away from just about half the police force in town either means he has absolutely massive balls or he's someone close within the police force. Yulia's father then pulls up and grabs her telling her that they're moving right now to Florida. See, this guy gets it. This is how you deal with shit if you're from Russia. No BS and straight results. Later that night, Scuba and Jess pay good old entrepreneur McCarthy a visit in order to load up on weapons. He's kindly letting them borrow whatever he has so I'm not sure why they're not stocking up on everything he has to offer. At least Scuba opts for the SIG P226 but Jess here refuses any firearms and even refuses a hidden tactical knife. Um, why? Are you that confident in your plot armour to save you? I mean sure, whatever works for you. Meanwhile, Yulia and her father begin packing their things and he even has the deputy sheriff protecting them. Absolutely perfect execution, the only thing I would suggest is not wearing noise cancelling headphones as you're still not in the clear. Unfortunately for them, our killer has 99 stealth and a silencer pistol. You know, I'm starting to think our killer may be a certain Agent 47 at this point. Seeing as our testosterone fueled Russian father isn't answering our calls, nor is the deputy sheriff responding, now might be the time to dial 911, barricade the door with our bed and arm ourselves with either the bedpost or fashion a shiv from the mirror. Staying on a FaceTime call was accidentally a smart thing to do, but unfortunately, Yulia doesn't hear the killer coming, nor will she be able to hear anything else in the future. This is the only time I'll forgive a character for crawling around on the floor. Having your eardrums perforated will cause the most extreme vertigo and dizziness one could experience. What I'm trying to say here is that she's screwed. The killer then picks up the FaceTime call and shows Scuba and Jess what they're missing out on. This prompts them to drive to her house and they're faced with a hostage situation. The killer also shows that Evan and Gabby aren't dead but they're tied up somewhere awaiting a grander plan. Personally, I'm exercising my second amendment and blasting away. Even if Yulia is caught in the crossfire, at least she'll die a hero and be reunited with her father rather than live a painful and silent life. And if he does decide to shoot, boy I do hope he doesn't have the safety on. Oh, 
Of course. While Scuba's playing with his gun, the killer throws Yulia at a buzzsaw and makes a getaway. She falls and her hand lands directly on top of the saw. I know it's a stressful moment, but there's plenty of space on that worktop where your hand could have landed. Before Scuba can pull her off in time, it's already too late. With Evan and Gabby being held in a secluded location, the police, along with Jess and Scuba, come up with a plan to lure him out and finish him once and for all. After hearing the sheriff's plan, I can confidently say that there's no way I'm trusting him anymore. Sure, let's place everyone left on the killer's target list onto a single pickup truck right in the middle of town. What exactly are you trying to accomplish here? And who's to say he won't just snipe us from the rooftop? He's already proved that he's willing to carry out an attack 20 feet away from the police at a school and he's also equipped with suppressed firearms. And even if we assume that he wants us alive, who's to say he won't cause a mass distraction which will be exemplified by crowd psychology, swoop in and take all of us from the silver platter that we've served ourselves on? And guess what happens? If we want any chance of catching this killer, we're going to have to convince him that we're still on the back foot and that he still has the element of surprise, and I have just a plan for that. Firstly, the only people I'm letting in on this are Jess, Scuba, McCarthy, and also Bobby despite the emphasis that he might be the killer, but as we've already outlined, our killer has military-esque movements and killing techniques and is highly proficient with a gun and a garret. Am I taking a gamble that a high schooler coming off a broken arm isn't capable of this? Sure, but he's also a valuable asset who has proven to stick his neck out for others, even strangers, and if worse comes to worse, he would be a perfect meat shield. I would also leave Ryan out of the plan despite his lack of motive due to high tensions with Bobby and overall secretive aura. The next step of the plan is to pay good old McCarty another visit and take up on his generosity with all those firearms and weapons he has. Then we go to one of our group members houses, preferably someone with a free house but if not an Airbnb will also suffice. We would then scout the house out to know every possible angle and entry and lock all possible entry points apart from the front and the back. After this, I would let everyone else not in our group know that we're laying low at this location and play dumb by expressing the fact that we're going to have a little party to relieve distress, but not too big of a party that it would deter the killer. A little Snapchat or Instagram post of us pretending to look drunk with the location conveniently on will do nicely. Who's going to doubt this? As far as I know, these are the biggest group of morons in the town. Then, when the killer arrives, it's a matter of camping the entry points without being seen and pumping him with lead. Unfortunately for our heroes, they all get kidnapped when hell breaks loose and their silver platter approach leads to an actual silver platter result. Let me explain. Kathleen here is being rubbed down but it seems a little unseasoned. For the pace, I would also add ginger, garlic, salt, pepper and lemon juice to the olive oil and also inject it sporadically in order for the flavour to absorb into the meat and at the same time it will result in a nice and crisp skin. While he does add salt, pepper and parsley for the rub, I would also include sage, rosemary, thyme and cayenne pepper if you're looking for a kick. Wait, 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 wait what the f*** am I talking about? <clears throat> Kathleen here is fucked. But luckily, our killer has made the mistake of not restraining her at all. Are you expecting your fully alive turkey to just comply? This mistake gives Kathleen the chance to escape when our killer leaves the room. What she should do is grab the knife he left behind and the pot of boiling water behind her and ambush him. Instead, she sneaks to the attic and actually lays a pretty smart trap using her footprints as bait, but the killer doesn't fall for it and she eventually gets caught again. She wakes up, now in the oven, and for the hundredth time, shouting help, let me out, will not result in the killer being like, oh my bad, let me just untie you and let you go. Her fate has been sealed at this point. As for the rest of the group, they're all gathered around the Thanksgiving table and this scene is by far the top three most unmonetizable scenes I've ever witnessed in a movie. Kathleen is served as a turkey on the table and the killer pokes a hole in Amy's lifeless neck and uses the fountain of blood that comes out as wine to serve to everyone. He then bashes Evan's head in for everyone including the livestream to see. While it's looking more and more hopeless by the minute, our hero Jess has one final trick up her sleeve. She was given a ring earlier in the movie by Bobby and it just so happens to have a blade and it also just so happens our killer decides to use rope to restrain everyone. Sure, you can acquire military grade smoke bombs and silencer pistols, but you draw the line at metallic handcuffs. Anyway, Jess manages to cut through her restraints and does the smartest thing she's done by keeping a poker face and handing the ring over to Scuba so they can 2v1 this sucker. And when you know it, the plan worked out a lot better than I expected. The two of them make a run for it and end up in a tight corridor where there should be easy pickings for John Carver, but luckily for them, he gets his axe lodged into a wall. 
While the killer is face down and trying to pull the axe out of the wall, why isn't Scuba booting him in the head? You're a D1 athlete, I have no doubt one kick and a couple stomps would seal the deal and make him the hero of the town. Instead, they run away and Scuba gets slashed on the arm. Rather than finishing him off, he opts to chase after Jess. You know, it would take like 2 seconds to axe Scuba in the head to prevent him from freeing the others while you go and chase Jess. Anyway, Jess reaches a fence and just about makes it over in time before the killer can catch her. Oh, so the fence is where you draw the line in terms of exerting energy? Right. Meanwhile, Jess reaches the local factory and sees someone inside wearing the John Carver costume and to her surprise, it's Bobby. Well shit, maybe I was wrong. But I do find it strange that if it was Bobby, how would he have made it here before Jess and surely he would be spawn camping her arrival if it was the only building around. Before she can process all of this, the sheriff intervenes and tells her to wait outside while he calls it in. The police and detectives arrive and inform Jess that Bobby escaped and her father along with Scuba and Gabby are at the hospital making a full recovery. While in the room alone with the sheriff, she notices brambles from the fence stuck to Newland's clothing and realises that he's been the killer all along. Rather than keep a poker face, which we know she can do, she gives the shit I know you're the killer face, which results in Newland locking the door and giving a villain monologue. Turns out he drugged Bobby and planned on framing him as the killer. Also, the reason he's been hunting them down is because he blames them all for Amanda's death during the stampede. Uh, who was that again? Oh yeah, the lady from the start that got her head scalped by the trolley. Turns out she was having an affair with the sheriff and was pregnant with his child. Yeah, cold world. Not only has the sheriff revealed this to Jess, but he's also revealed it to all her loyal fans out there because she was live streaming the whole time. That was a smart move straight out of Starlight's book against Homelander. This does also mean the sheriff has nothing to lose now, which results in him attacking Jess, but surprise surprise, Bobby saves her in time. Now, with the sheriff on the floor unconscious and defenceless, Bobby and Jess exercise their rights and pick up the axe clearly displayed on the wall and then begin chopping him up to pieces before being crowned the heroes of the town and then they live happily ever after. Except this is what would happen if they had a combined IQ above room temperature. Instead, they leave him with the axe and run away. Can you guess what happens next? Yes, he gets up with the axe and chases after them. Jess and Bobby manage to get a tow truck going but Newland hooks the trailing cable to a support beam which stops them in their tracks. Luckily, Jess finds a musket in the back of the truck because that's what people usually have lying around in the back of their trucks. Despite dropping every bullet she has on the floor, she loads the gun up with her mother's bracelet and shoots the inflatable filled with gas behind Newland which explodes and finishes him off for good. Can any firearm experts confirm in the comments section if this is even in the realm of possibility? I also hate to break it to Jess, but outside of Hollywood and video games, shooting a flammable inflatable or even gas tank in most cases doesn't work as proven by Mythbusters. What she should have done was load the musket up with actual bullets, wait for Newland to approach as we know he doesn't have a long distance weapon and then shoot him point blank before stomping on him several more times. Anyway, the next morning Jess and Bobby reunite with Scuba and Gabby and the detectives inform her that no remains were found and that he must have disintegrated from the explosion. Um, no he would not have disintegrated from the explosion. What donkeys do you have working in the forensics department? 1.25 times 10 to the 8 joules of energy is needed to vaporise a human and that's assuming all the energy goes into vaporising with zero penetration. To prove my point, I'll use the most extreme case which is an atomic bomb. This yields roughly 3 times 10 to the 13 of thermal energy. From the paper cited here, you would have to be within 231 meters of the Nagasaki atomic bomb to be vaporized. The explosion that hit the sheriff doesn't even come close to a fraction of an atomic bomb. You may have heard of cases where an explosion occurred and there were no remains. This is explained due to imprecise vocabulary as while true the victim wasn't left intact, there were however splatters of bone and blood around the area every time even if it was unseeable to the human eye. What I'm trying to say is that there's 0% chance he got vaporised and you should fire everyone in the forensics department and pull your resources into hunting him down. Anyway, the movie then ends with Jess in bed having a dream about Newland attacking her. With that being said, this whole thing could have been prevented if Thomas had implemented basic retail store protocols on Black Friday. Following the massacre, all our characters had more than enough chance to take him down except from Lonnie and Amy whose deaths were pretty unbeatable. Had the police also taken the posts more seriously and actually come up with a half decent plan, I would say that John Carver was beaten. Thank you for watching, don't forget to like and subscribe and remember, online shopping exists.